Uh, thanks, Martin. So let me um, let me answer that question in two parts. So the first part, I want to talk about just um, the internet in Europe and its relationship to culture, and then I'll talk about Google more specifically. So. All right, anytime you analyze a problem like this, um, you have to start with the premise that information is power, right? So uh, 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 what the internet is doing with information is decentralizing and democratizing access to information. Um, so um, in three different ways, you see, uh, in, you see information, uh, the, the internet kind of radically changing our relationship to information. So the first is creation, second is access, third is distribution, right? So um, so when I was a teenager uh, in the 80s, my ability to generate and speak and get access to information was really pretty limited, right? I couldn't get on TV, I couldn't be on the radio, um, I couldn't be in the newspaper except maybe like a letter to the editor, you know, once a year or something like that. But my ability to speak was limited to my friends and my family. Um, and now the default, right, so the norm for a teenager sitting in a bedroom with a Mac laptop and an internet connection is being able to communicate with everybody on the planet instantaneously. Um, and that is a profound shift, uh, and I think we're only barely beginning to understand the implications of it. And in the area of culture, um, which Europe takes very seriously, this is a very significant change. Um, and so, uh, so um, then it's important to say that there are institutions um, that have built their power around control of information. So. Um, Governments and government agencies are one example, um, but there are also businesses whose economic power depends on controlling the flow of information. We heard Michael talking about television earlier, but I think if you want to look at business models, right, um, movie studios, television networks, book publishers, magazine publishers, they've done, they've got two things, they've had sort of two business lines. I mean, maybe this is oversimplifying a little bit, but they've been venture capitalists and they've been distributors. Right, so if you're a movie studio, your venture capital function is to put money on the table and to pay for the production of films. And then you make money when you earn money more than the production of films. Same thing if you're a record label or a book publisher, right? You put money down, the thing gets written or produced, and then you try to profit. The second part of their business has been uh, distribution. So if you're a movie studio, uh, and, and I should also say, all of these distribution business models have in common the concept of scarcity you are able to make money because distribution is scarce. So there's, in a given country, there's only a certain end of movie theaters and a certain number of seats in front of those theaters. If your movie is going to make money, it has to get on the screen in front of the seats. And so the studios have been specialists in knowing how to take a movie and then get it distributed. And uh, their specialties in knowing which movies people are going to want to go see, and so that the movie theaters want that studio's movies because they want to get as many ticket sales as possible. But anyway, it's all built around scarcity. Um, with records and CDs, it's literally been physical shelf space. You know, there's only so many shelves, uh, and, so, and, and same thing for books. Um, and, uh, and with television, there's only a certain number of channels and a certain number of hours of the day. So it's scarce, you have to get it in there. And what the internet is doing is it's destroying the economic returns that you get from distribution for, my, for much of this culture. Um, uh, it doesn't alter, by the way, the venture capital profits that you can get. I mean, still there's a totally a market, it just means that the money that you can make through distribution is sort of limited. So um, anyway, so information is power. Um, people who have traditionally controlled information are finding their power threatened by this. And I think if we extend this into, and, and then I should say what they do is they then often try to go to legislatures and to try to find ways to lock up their power in the face of this distribution legally. Um, and uh, you know, I don't need, uh, you all are, you know, you know, I don't need to tell this story, but you know, it's copyrights and trademarks and uh, um, uh, the most extreme example, by the way, just as a footnote, the most extreme example I've seen of this lately has to do with maps. So you know, Google does Google Maps and Google Earth. So there are countries where it is legally prohibited to create or sell a map or provide a map except from this one government agency. Um, so uh, India is one of these countries. They've got a survey of India and it's legally the only body that's able to publish maps. And so, you know, the internet comes along and all of a sudden Google Earth and Google Maps exist and we do them on servers out of California, just like uh, Jake was saying about you know, China, we're careful about where we put our servers because then you can provide India Maps and they have no jurisdiction over it. So anyway, it destroys the, the bureaucratic raison d'etre of that, you know, of that set of uh, bureaucrats and the power that they rest on. Anyway, so, um, 
So then, so then turning to Europe uh, in, in, in particular, um, I think the struggle for people who um, have, um, uh, have a concern for the preservation of culture is how do you uh, uh, maintain and preserve and ideally strengthen uh, your culture, which has to do with language, which has to do with history and tradition, which has to do with um, a sense of nationhood or, or, um, or, or a sub-nationhood in a region. You know, for example, if you're in a Basque country or a Catalonia or uh, Provence, uh, Provence or something like that, you've got this sense of, um, of sort of culture. The, the challenge is, so if the internet is gonna do this kind of like flattening of distribution and suddenly anybody can distribute into your territory, um, uh, you know, how do you preserve? Um, and how do you maintain? And um, I think that the, this, there's a sort of, uh, uh, I mean, I, 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 I think that there's a, there's a tendency uh, also to react like we've seen other industries do, which is to say we have to be able to control, right? So we have to be able to limit. Um, and here the paradigm might be France and movies, right? So the French have, 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 have had these um, restrictions on movies. And those restrictions are built on the idea of scarcity, just like in these other industries. So there's only n number of movie screens, and the French government has said, movie theater, only this percent of your movies can be from outside France in a given year. And that is enforceable um, in a world where there are physical prints, right? Like there's only a certain number of prints, and they limit how many you can bring into the country, and they limit how many you can show on a screen. So anyway, the internet comes along, and it makes all the world's movies you know, accessible to anybody in France at any time. So, footnote here, footnote two. Um, the internet has up until recently been able to um, evade uh, geo-targeted regulations, right? So, um, uh, uh, there was a famous case in, uh, in, you know, well, actually, let me just give the very short version of this. If you're in Germany, even though the German government prohibits, uh, let's say, Mein Kampf, right? So it's illegal in Germany, um, you can still get Mein Kampf over the internet, right? Uh, there's, there's no way to stop people in Germany from, from reading it um, because of the nature of the internet. What we are seeing, however, is in the last couple of years, there has been this uh, uh, convergence of pressure on the internet to make things geographically excludable, right? So, they, so the, the governments have started to get smart, and China is the leading edge of this, but they're, 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 their tactics are now becoming much more widespread, which is to say, ah, if you don't like something, force your ISPs to block it. We can't, you know, if you think about the internet as an application layer and then an, uh, a, a transport layer, you know, you can't block things at the application layer because anybody can build a website or a web server and, you know, be on the internet. But the ISP is physically in your country and it's got wires and it's got uh, access controls. So you can use your ISPs to block things you don't like. Um, and this is happening all over the place. Copyright infringement, we're seeing all kinds of proposals to, you know, do geo-targeted blocking of websites that you think are going to enable copyright infringement. Geo-targeted websites of things that are racist or uh, promote uh, terrorism uh, is another common uh, popular theme in Europe these days. And so my observation about Europe has been that these, that the notions of control over information as a tactic of achieving social objectives um, uh, is much better accepted in Europe than it is in the United States. So in the U.S., there's an initial allergy to any proposal which has to do with controlling information. And it's built, you know, we've got this First Amendment which gives the courts an incredibly powerful weapon to, to strike at any attempt to control information. So you want to be a racist, America is your country. You know, you want to you speak uh, racism, anti-Semitism, hate speech, misogyny, we accept all of that because we've got a political theory that says that truth beats falsity and people can be trusted to you know, respond to bad things with good things. But um, the European traditions have been much more sensitive. And I take a country like Germany, which has a clear historical basis right, for a judgment made by a mature democracy to limit speech. And uh, that sort of basic acceptance that limits on speech can be socially acceptable bleeds into this culture issue. And so we see much more of a kind of a difficult struggle in Europe as institutions that have traditionally been part of the culture establishment, like the libraries, uh, the culture ministries, uh, film production boards, and so forth, are trying to figure out um, how to you know, meet their mandates in the internet. And I guess I'll just close my talk saying, um, I think what's really interesting is that I still think that for the same reasons that, uh, that the internet is a powerful force for good in a place like China, however difficult and compromising and however, you know, sort of um, uh, painful these transitions are, uh, the basic, you know, if you, let me say footnote three, 
you know, uh, I started going to China about 10 years ago and started doing a lot of work there. And I don't speak Chinese, so this is, you should totally discredit what I'm about to say as a total amateur, you know, kind of observation. But based on the friends that I've got in China, the amount of free expression that is taking place in China today is profoundly, dramatically more than it was 10 years ago. Profoundly, dramatically more than it was five years ago. And it's not because um, Chinese people ha are getting access to things from outside China, right? Most Chinese people could not care less to read a really well-argued polemic against Communist Party rule or censorship or any of those things from a, a form of foreign human rights group. They couldn't care less. They're nationalists as well as um, you know, internet users. What they do want is to talk to each other. And so the powerful changes in China are from Chinese people talking to Chinese people about um, corruption, about uh, social services, about uh, foreign policy, whatever it might be, and they're talking to each other. So um, the same thing I think is true in Europe, which is to say that I think that what will salvage, what will, what will help turn the internet into the best friend that European cultures have ever had is Europeans talking to other Europeans in Catalan and uh, you know, creating things uh, amongst themselves rather than worrying so much about the invasions of uh, threatening cultures and barbarians and vandals and so forth from outside their, their cultures. Um, uh, so I'm actually quite optimistic. I can say at a political level, though, um, Google finds that our struggles in Europe um, over policy questions around control of content, sometimes it gets called uh, child protection, sometimes it gets called copyright uh, protection, sometimes it gets called um, uh, uh, anti-terrorist, anti-racist, whatever it is, the mechanisms of control in Europe are getting stronger and stronger and stronger every year. And my only note to all of you who are entrepreneurs in Europe is that I've noticed that there is a, a, a serious lack of activism and input by Europeans, especially at the, at the EU level. Um, uh, I see these proposals go you know, sort of uh, plowing their way through Europe like the Audiovisual Media Services Directive. Like, how many of you have paid any attention to the Audiovisual Media Services Directive? Literally like nobody. So, so this is a directive that's going to try to apply television content rules to internet video. Right? Like, what at first blush to me is kind of a, a crazy idea. Right? Like, internet is not scarce. Right? Uh, the idea that, you know, we're going to say between the hours of uh, 9 in the morning to 9 at night, here's the kinds of content you can't show on video. And in the language of the European U uh, Commission, this is a perfectly logical thing to do because you need to harmonize your rules. Oh, your national broadcasters are subject to all this regulation, so everybody who does video in Europe should be subject to harmonized regulation. Anyway, all of you who, uh, and I know uh, if, uh, if, if you listen to you know, Jonas's, uh, Jonas's talk the other day, um, this stuff really matters. It's really going to affect your business. It has a real potential to be a bad thing for Europe. And um, my um, hope is that we will see European entrepreneurs and, and, and startup people in particular um, who are doing internet-based applications get involved in these uh, policy debates because even for the best of reasons, you can prove uh, you can use the wrong mechanism and the wrong means. And I do see some tendency, um, in, in my judgment, not only in Europe, of course, but also in Europe, um, to use the wrong mechanisms to achieve those ends. Thank you. Thank you.